Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending the today's Spark Talk. Today's speaker is uh, Dr. Paul Nunez. And I'm Makoto Miyakoshi from the Institute for Neural Computation, SWAT Center for Computational Neuroscience. Dr. Paul Nunez is an emeritus professor of biomedical engineering at Tulane University. Today, he will talk about the brains as complex systems, multi-scale source of EEG, genuine, equivalent, and representative. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to see a few people here. I, was, uh, I always wonder if I'm gonna give a talk, if I'm gonna be talking to myself or a whole group of people. Uh, I want to start off uh, by just uh, pointing out, I have kind of a long title here for this talk, and I've got a space between the, after the first line to kind of indicate that there's two parts to this. I, what I had in mind was talking about some general ideas about complex systems uh, in the first part, and uh, I don't know how many, we might have some real experts here in complex systems that know more about it than I do. But uh, just kind of a, come up with uh, some general ideas that may apply to a broad range of uh, brain research. And then uh, going into, the f following that, going into the second part, uh, talking a little bit about how, much, how these ideas might apply to EEG, uh, in particular the multi-scale aspects of EEG. I should point out here that, uh, whoops, see that little Z there? Uh, my last name ends in Z, not S, because as far as I know, I, I don't have any close relatives that are politicians. Just point that out. <laughs> There's a few, the t uh, top two of the references that uh, we just talked about, and uh, the last uh, paper here, whoops, the last paper here is a, a review paper, and I just want to say a couple of words of what, what motivated this paper. Um, a couple of years ago, this uh, International Federation uh, of Clinical Neurophysiology decided to come up with guidelines for EEG uh, research in clinical EEG, and they uh, recruited 15 EEG scientists from around the world, including me. And uh, so we had to come up with these guidelines. We had a lot of emails going back and forth for six months or a year or so, and uh, there were a lot of disagreements among this group of people about what should be put in there. and. Uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that the source of, no pun intended, but the source of these disagreements was the word source. That uh, a lot of people had kind of vague ideas about what, what we mean by EEG sources. And uh, so I started by writing a, a letter to the editor to try to clarify some of this stuff up. and. As a result of that, there was a lot of feedback and back and forth, and uh, it ended up to be a small paper, and then it ballooned into a uh, tutorial. Okay, we've shown those images before. This is not my book. It's a book by this, uh, edited by this uh, mathematician at uh, Caltech. But I just put it in here to kind of, it's a nice picture but uh, illustrate, illustrate the idea that a lot of the uh, work on complex systems has a lot, of do, a lot to do with multi-scale dynamics, dynamics uh, uh, re either, re either theoretical or experimental work at dif different spatial scales. And um, over the past 20 or 30 years, complex systems has been studied by a lot of people and uh, the idea here is to say something general about these systems that uh, may give us some, some guesses or some conjectures about 
what might happen in the brain in various situations. So um, taking brain complexity seriously. Uh, a long, long time ago, I was in a bar and I struck up a conversation with this old guy and he told me things should be kept as simple as possible but not simpler. Actually, it wasn't really Einstein. It was just somebody pretending to be Einstein. <laughs> so normally in science, we go from step A to step B, take little steps and build on what people have done before, and I'm not uh, arguing against that by any means. But th th this little diagram here is a kind of a philosophical explanation or a philosophical proposal which says that maybe it's useful to assume that the brains are complex systems and then uh, that may lead to some speculations about what we should be seeing in the brain and then th we, can we can check those speculations against existing neuroscience and see if it, it seems to make sense that this is a, an idea or these are ideas to pursue and uh, if so, we might say that those ideas then are brain friendly. If they're not brain friendly, we go back and we could go back and make different speculations. So that's kind of the, the, the basis for some of the ideas that I want to present. Here's some example complex systems. The one I like as brain metaphor is the social systems because if you use a social system as a metaphor for what you think is going on, everybody can understand, everybody has a good idea of what social systems are like, so you have a good, uh, it makes a nice metaphor. Whereas if you use something like uh, spin glasses or holograms or uh, other, other physical systems that, that might be similar in some ways, then the trouble is your audience doesn't know what a spin glass is, then it doesn't help very much. Okay, this Seth Lloyd is a, a physicist at MIT and he likes Barnes and Noble, or not Barnes and Noble, uh, he likes uh, 31 flavors of ice cream, so he uh, came up with 31 different characteristic, characteristics of complex systems. Uh, which I've listed a few here. Emergent phenomena, uh, of course, is a big one. I would, might say that in emergent phenomena, we have some complex, some system consisting of a bunch of small units which are interacting in some way. And uh, as a result of that, those interactions, uh, we get su surprising properties of uh, the, macro, the, the macroscopic system that was based on microscopic uh, interactions. Uh, in some cases, these emergent phenomena can be explained in the following sense, and that is once we see what happens, say, with a, uh, at the molecular level, then we can uh, go back and rationalize that based on, say, basic quantum mechanics, but that's a quite a different thing than starting with quantum mechanics and predicting uh, behavior at the molecular level. In other cases, and the most, uh, probably the most dramatic one is consciousness itself, we can say that, uh, we can postulate that consciousness emerges from uh, complex systems, but if we can't go backwards and, and come up with some sort of narrative uh, is how that might have occurred. And the, uh, the last one here, uh, I particularly like in, in the case of uh, brain uh, implications, is simple behavior can change abruptly into complicated behavior and back again. Here are some uh, common features of complex systems. And uh, the second one, non-local interactions. I've hyphenated the word non-local here because uh, physicists use the word non-local without the hyphen to indicate faster than light uh, information transfer. And uh, this is what something I mean different 
I mean, a non-local non interaction and just means that, for example, if I send an email from here to London, uh, it, inter it uh, affects only what happens in London and not anything in between here in London. And of course, all networks of all different kinds are inherently non-local. Okay, this is a, one of my favorite complex systems. It's a football stadium full of people, 50,000 people, say. And uh, before the game starts, most of the interactions are local. People are talking to each other. Uh, and uh, there might be some non-local interactions. Uh, for example, some guy, whoops, some guy with a cell phone here is talking with somebody in a cell phone over there. That would be a, that would be a non-local interaction. Uh, when the, when a touchdown is scored, everybody's cheering together. Not everybody, but uh, a large fraction of the people are cheering together, and uh, we might call that a state of global coherence. So the idea here is that. Uh, in brain research, it seems to me that uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, brains can't operate in, uh, across the whole spectrum between the state of functional isolation versus global coherence. Uh, and um, I think that that kind of metaphor gives us, uh, is one of those guesses or one of those speculations can be that this has a lot to do with, uh, for example, mental diseases of various kinds. Uh, recently, fairly recently, or relatively recently, I think MRI has uh, shown a lot of uh, correlations between different kinds of mental diseases uh, and dysfun mental dysfunction and white matter abnormalities. The white matter, of course, the layer of, of axons uh, just below the cortex carrying signals uh, across the brain. Uh, in other words, non-local interactions between different parts of the brain. And uh, the timing of those uh, axon signals is affected by the myelination, brain myelination, of course. And so uh, I like, I, I'm not going to have too many quotes here, but I particularly like this one. This is Gerald Edelman, who ran the uh, Neuroscience Institute up here, uh, Torrey Pines for years, and Tioni uh, wrote this book, Universe of, Con Universe of Consciousness. And uh, high values of complexity correspond to an optimal synthesis, synthesis of functional specialization and functional integration within a system. This is the, clearly the case for systems like the brain. Oh, okay, thanks. Different areas of the brain do different things. They are uh, uh, differentiated. At the same time, they interact to give rise to a unified consciousness scene and to unify behaviors. They are integrated. So they make the argument that uh, although those various ways to define complexity that maximum complexity of a system uh, occurs at this intermediate state between global coherence and functional localization. Again, thinking back to uh, the football stadium again, the maximum complexity of the football fans uh, in this view then occurs not when everybody's all yelling together and not when people are just having isolated conversations, but somewhere in the middle when both, both are happening at the same time. In the case of EEG, uh, there are various measures of functional con connections between different parts of the brain. Uh, one is coherence. Coherence is just a, a correlation coefficient expressed as a function of frequency. So, for example, uh, in the uh, 
resting EEG of the alpha rhythm. You're sitting here quietly with your eyes closed, and uh, if you measure the coherence between different parts of the brain, what you find is that the coherence is relatively high in a narrow frequency band, and outside of that band, it's uh, low. And that coherence pattern can be manipulated by various uh, mental tasks, uh, which in which coherence in some bands can go up and coherence in other bands can go down, sort of indicating that there's some network activity that's being enhanced by whatever mental activity is taking place and other, other uh, things are going on uh, in other frequency bands. Another one, uh, a, di a different kind of uh, measure of functional connections between different parts of the brain is covariance, uh, which is a function of time delay. So point A in the, in the cortex can be connected to point B, <clears throat> but only after a time delay. And uh, here's, that's, uh, I'll show an example of that in a minute. This, to me, gives us some suggestions that some uh, mental dysfunctions can be related to this functional connection issue. You know, maybe coma is a hypercoupled state where there's too much functional connections between two, two different parts of the brain. And schizophrenia may be the opposite, which is different parts of the brain are not uh, so well connected. That's, a, that's a, one of these speculations that has got some evidence from uh, the way neurotransmitters act in different depths of the cortex. Going back to the covariance, this is uh, from Alan Givens' lab up in San Francisco where the subject there is asked to push a button with a certain force and uh, the, the uh, covariance patterns here are <clears throat> shown just before the button is actually pushed. And uh, the covariance here is uh, significant after some time delay, in this case, something like 80 milliseconds. Okay, uh, so I've suggesting some myths resulting from a failure to recognize brains as complex systems. Uh, the word myth is perhaps a little strong here because all of these ideas have uh, indeed have some uh, support. But um, in my view, they're, often, uh, is, they're wrong uh, just as often as they're right. <clears throat> Isolated dipoles generally approximate general neural sources. I think uh, a lot of cases where localized sources have been claimed that I would argue that they're really distributed over much larger regions. MEG has all, all, uh, long been a, been a uh, somewhat controversial in my mind since it's first uh, developed in the early 80s. I'll take a quick break for a drink here while you look at this. When I first got inter interested in this, I was very interested in the, the uh, alpha rhythm, which is, again, this rhythm that nearly everybody produces when he's just sitting there quietly because I came in in the field and uh, recorded somebody's EEG, and here was a sine wave coming out. Looked like a sine wave. And uh, how can a complex brain just produce a sine wave? It didn't, didn't sit right with me. I was expecting to see something really complicated. Well, as it turns out, the alpha rhythm is pretty complicated. But uh, when you just record it from the uh, scalp and you don't do any processing of the uh, data, 
it does look like something very simple. And uh, this led to the, uh, a lot of people thought that the alpha rhythm was just a, an idling rhythm. Whereas now we know that uh, different parts of the alpha band do different things. Part, some parts are coherent over large regions and other parts are uh, uh, not, not coherent, they're incoherent. And uh, some parts of this band is affected by mental activity uh, in different ways than other parts of the band. And so the whole story is a lot more complicated than uh, one might think in the beginning. Now, uh, in the case of EEG, we have some information in which we can, from basic stuff, that we can make use of. The first one is volume conduction. That is, if we have some sources here, those sources are uh, current sources. Uh, the units are microamps per micrometer, for example, current per unit volume. If, if we have some behavior of those sources, we can calculate the potential in the tissue from this equation. This is Poisson's equation. The sigma up there is the con conductivity of tissue. And uh, this equation is very valuable e even whether we can solve it or not because it gives us some guidelines on how we can relate the potentials uh, phi to the uh, sources S. The question of uh, one, one question that comes up, some, of this, some aspects of brain science or EEG science are sensitive to the uh, accuracy of these solutions, uh, which can, can be a problem, for example, in source localization. Because mainly because the sigma that I've written here as a as a scalar, which is for tissue that is, that is isotropic. Uh, in fact, tissue is anisotropic, and so this is really a tensor quantity. Um, but nevertheless, there are other things that this t tells us that are insensitive to the details of the mo of the uh, head model, and those can be very useful. Uh, I'll just mention one right off the bat here, and that is that if you have a source, a localized source in the cortex that occupies something like uh, several square millimeters or, or less, you can, from this equation, you can estimate what the ratio of the magnitude of scalp potential is to cortical potential. And that estimate is insensitive to uh, details about the volume conductor. And so the, what, what is the answer to that? That is, the answer is if you have a very localized source in the cortex, the ratio of scalp potential to cortical potential is something like 1 over 100. It's two orders of magnitude smaller. In other words, if you have 100 microvolts on the cortex, you get about one microvolt on the one microvolt on the scalp, and this is consistent with the kind of the neurosurgeon's rule of thumb, which says that you need something like six to ten square six to ten square centimeters of <coughs> synchronous sources in the cortex before you can even measure anything on the scalp. So, and again, that estimate is is uh, pretty reliable and insensitive to the details of the head model. The, the, the dynamics of this system uh, is a whole nother, another story. Uh, the sources S uh, can be modeled by various mathema 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 mathematical methods, uh, which are the, the fancy R there, it just indicates a whole a bunch of different mathematical operators that have been applied in various cases. 
and uh, they've been applied at the uh, small scale. The S here, uh, if you discrete it, make these discrete sources at the synaptic level, uh, there'd be about 10 to the 14th total uh, current sources in the, in the cortex. Uh, and when you, what you get from these various models are local sources, extended networks, limit cycles, traveling waves, standing waves, chaos. Depending on the model, you can get all these different phenomena. And uh, that, that uh, suggested to me the, what I call the five-beer theory. Five-beer theory means you have to have five beers before you take it seriously. <laughs> there are various levels of confidence in these different kinds of models. And uh, what, what this suggests is that any mathematics that happens inside the brain, happens outside the brain, can potentially happen inside the brain. In other words, you come up with some mathematical model or models and you, and you get f phenomena that you may recognize uh, from other co completely different fields. Perhaps the most uh, famous of these models uh, in, in relation to EEG is the Wilson-Cowan model, which was developed around 1972. Uh, they actually came here to USSD and gave that talk uh, on this topic. Uh, in the last uh, few years, my colleagues and I at UC Irvine have gone through this model and, uh, tried to update it and correct it a little bit, make it a little more physiological, physiologically realistic. Now, I, I, I should mention that the Wilson-Cowan model is based on local delays. By the, that, I mean postsynaptic rise and decay times. If you have some oscillation in any kind of system, one of the first questions you might ask is, what are the underlying time constants that underlie this dynamics? Before you get in any mathematical detail at all, that seems to be one of the things you should ask, ask about. About the same time as these guys, um, I developed this idea not based on local delays, but just by, just on uh, axon delays. And this looks rather complicated, but all it means, all it really means is that uh, what happens at one point in the, lo in the cortex depends on what happens at other points in the cortex, but after some time delay due to axon, finite velocity of axon propagation. And this model predicts, uh, can predict frequencies roughly in the EEG range. I'm not going to say much about any more about that because it's too complicated for this for a kind of seminar. So if you have two point sources here just separated by a distance d, then you have a the potential can be expressed in terms of this dipole formula, and uh, that expression is valid only at uh, large distances from the uh, dipole source location. In large distances r and compared to the distance d between the two point sources. On the other hand, when you take the same current and distribute it over a, a number of uh, po point sources and sinks, you can express the potential with the same solution, except that instead of using this d here, you use a, a smaller d in, uh, as in this formula. And so what this basically means is that the large potentials that we record on the scalp uh, are dependent upon the separation in the, in the, in the, uh, across the cortex of the sources of the sinks. If the sources and sinks could become too mixed, then this D, with a D bar, uh, 
uh, goes to zero, electrophysiologists call this a closed field. So the implication for this, for example, is that you can have a lot of activity in a local region of cortex and get very little signal if the sources are mixed. So um, in studies, for example, that try to uh, Coral, uh, try to combine fMRI, for example, and EEG, you're going to have a lot of uh, activity uh, measured uh, with uh, blood flow or metabolic activity in the case of PET. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to match what you get from your EEG signal. And, uh, okay, so here, because of the fact that uh, at the synaptic level you have 10 to the 14th sources of EEG at the micro level, you can, it's convenient to um, replace these micro sources S with a macro source P, which is just the integral over the uh, volume W. This volume W could be a, a cortical macro column containing about a million neurons and about uh, 10 to the 10th synaptic sources. And it's convenient to do this in many cases. And uh, I just mentioned that this works only if current is locally conserved, which means that all the sources and sinks balance in the local area. Otherwise, you don't get a, a dip what's called a dipole potential. And uh, once, once you have defined this macroscopic source P here, which has the units of current density, microamps per square millimeter, for example, uh, it can be thought of as sort of a diffuse current density across the cortex. You've simplified things quite a bit. It's not simple by any means. The G here is the, called the Green's function, and all the properties of the volume conductor are contained in that G function. So we, rep and we represent 10 to the 14th synaptic scale microsource courses with perhaps uh, 100,000 macro column scale sources P distributed over the cortical surface A. Source localization, of course, basically involves starting with a measured potential V on the scalp and using some model G and integrating that uh, into the uh, ma macro source P and trying to solve this equation. This, this equation has no unique solutions. So you, in order to do source localization, you need uh, other information, which are called the constraints. This just illustrates the, the idea that large scalp potentials. This is, this is uh, a simulation where this, think of this rectangle as 10 by 10 centimeters, and each of these dots is at the macro, scala, uh, macro column scale. And if they're randomly, ori randomly oriented like this, where the, uh, a filled space indicates a positive source, source and a empty space, a negative source, then you get kind of small potentials on the surface of the, this is the surface of the scalp. Whereas they become patchy and correlated to some degree as over here that you get much larger scalp potentials. Just a general idea. Here's a rule of thumb that says, suppose that this black dot here in the middle it represents a scalp electrode. And you ask the question, suppose the entire cortex was filled with sources uniformly distributed over the entire cortex. And you ask, at what radius, in this case three centimeters, uh, of activity 
is contributing half of the signal to this electrode. In other words, half of the signal to this electrode is coming from this three centimeter dia uh, radius of circle around the electrode, and the other half is coming from the rest of the cortex. So what this tells you is comparing, for example, EEG recorded from the scalp to uh, E. COG, that's the cortical recordings, is they don't, you don't expect them to match each other very closely in any particular way. They're different, different scales of measurement. And whatever conclusions you come about, for example, functional connectivity that you get with scalp recordings, that doesn't simply translate into what would happen if you were doing the same thing on the cortex. They're different scales of measurement. Let me just go a little further with this. Uh, these little arrows here represent the P, the macro sources, discretized at the various locations. And um, I've got an EEG electrode and an MEG uh, sensor there. And what do we have here? We have these are all lined up perpendicular to the local cortical surface, which is based on plausible assumptions, plausible assumptions about how sources work in the cortex, not guaranteed, but plausible. And what does the EEG electrode pick up? It picks up mainly this, these sources from A to B, D to E, and G to H. It's le much less sensitive to these sources because they're, first of all, they're deeper in the cortex. And secondly, they tend to cancel each other if they're uh, on either side of a cortical fold. Uh, the EEG electrode is also insensitive to these randomly uh, oriented sources. Uh, what does the MEG pick up? The MEG tends to be insensitive to sources which are um, radial sources that are perpendicular to the coil, but it's much more sensitive to tangential sources. So the MEG tends not to pick up these for the various reasons because they tend to be radial sources, whereas it's most sensitive to this fold right here, H through I, because these sources are not opposed, they're random on the other side of the fold, and they're perpendicular to the cortex here. So what this indicates to you is to, to, uh, in this analysis is that if you have an MEG signal, that's the magnetic field for those of you, I assume you know that, uh, you get a localized source signal here, but you don't see all these other sources. On the other hand, the EEG sees something different. It sees sources in this large correlated dipole layer across here, and it's less sensitive to these sources and folds. So the point being that each of these measures um, is selectively sensitive to not only a different scale of sources, but also a different orientation of sources in this case. And this is a simulation with a collaboration with the, my uh, friends at Irvine. There's one source, one sensor here, which is up here, which is under, right under there. And uh, in this simulation, you put 100,000 sources in each uh, hemisphere of the cortex. And you ask the question, how much does each of those sources contribute to this one sensor here? And the uh, upper image is the raw EEG, and you see you get a big contribution from right from the uh, cortical gyri right under that sensor, and uh, right under that uh, region. And uh, but you also get substantial contributions from other parts of the cortex. 
The uh, lower image here is the MEG. You ask the same question. Where does it, what part of the cortex is the MEG contributing to? Uh, where, where does most of the signal come from? And uh, you get this picture. The, this one right here is from what's called uh, the, the Laplacian. It's high resolution EEG, and it uh, tends to be sensitive only to the very local region. So I come uh, up with this conclusion. Uh, if brains are complex system, systems, measures of brain activity, and I put those in quotes because uh, the word activity come, is sometimes used, uh, used kind of loosely because activity could be different kinds of activity that don't have to agree with each other. You can have electrical activity doesn't have to agree with blood flow activity and, or metabolic activity. There are different kinds of activity. But anyway, measures of activity should be generally be expressed as be expected to be sensitive to the measured quantity, whether you're measuring these different things. Time scale, as in time averaged evoke potentials, and spatial scale, um, whether you're measuring with local field potentials, that's LEP, is local field potentials. Uh, Laplacian, which is high resolution EEG, or unprocessed EEG. And so functional connectivity, which seems to me clearly very important in brain science, uh, cannot just be interpreted in absolute terms. And uh, just I have an analogy to the local systems, to social systems here. If you measure the functional connectivity in some way between San Diego and, and uh, some other city, you can think of functional connectivity in terms of the by getting some uh, measure of the entire population of those cities, or you can take individual neighborhoods, or and they, let's say we're talking about functional connectivity in terms of uh, blood sugar level of, of people in each location. Uh, it's going to be very different, or it could be very different depending on the scale of the measurement, how whether you're talking about the whole city, averages over the whole city, or whether you're talking about just particular neighborhoods or individual persons. This is kind of obvious, I guess, but uh, it's, worth, it's worth remembering. Okay, I've kind of said all this. I do want to just read this bottom part here. Measures in, at large scales are not simply poorly resolved representations of the underlying uh, of the underlying smaller scale behavior. Rather, different scales offer parallel and complementary views of brain dynamics consistent with the nested hierarchy of brain structure. Okay, that's a good place to stop. I've got a lot of other slides of related to potential questions, but uh, I'd like to end there and leave room for discussion if we, we have any. Thank you. Any questions? Curious about the uh, what we know about the spatial extent of these cortical generators for EEG. So you did a back of the envelope calculation many years ago in one of your papers, where you sort of estimated it was roughly maybe like five centimeters square. It was possible, probably the kind of extent of the coherent uh, local field that could be detected at the scalp through EEG. 
Have you sort of revised your thinking extensively on that? Do you have thoughts on sort of theoretical boundaries where we can say it is impossible to detect a cortical, coherent cortical store smaller than an extent of X in the human brain? <coughs> X, you know, centimeters in diameter or squared or centimeters squared. Right. Well, I, I haven't revised it for the most part, but I, I would say that when you get in, if you're talking about average evoke potentials, if you're going to time average something, mm -hmm. then it's a little unclear as to how, how good your res resolution could be, because then it depends upon the stationarity of the, the background signal and, and a number of things that are kind of hard to predict. So, mm -hmm. uh, right. of course, the, maybe the best old example is the brainstem evoke potential. Brainstem auditory evoke potential, right. which involves averages over thousands of lips, but that that particular potential generator generator or generators seems to be uh, stationary over time. So that you can, in theory, if it's stationary, then you can drive this signal to noise ratio to infinity, basically, sure. by just taking more longer averages. So let's assume that single measurement vector kind of approach, you know, uh, uh, not averaging, um, I, I have essentially a sample of data from N channels, like, uh, I guess, I, and I don't know, if you don't have an exact number, that's totally fine, I'm just curious, like, where the sort of theoretical models have evolved over the years to give us some kind of hard boundary, theoretically, below, like, we, we think that we can get, like, centimeter scale reconstruction with sort of sparse reconstruction methods, but it's possible, theoretically, you could do, and I'm talking about single trial, like single measurement, mm -hmm. um, it's possible you could do a millimeter, in theory, under, with the right kind of signal processing, or are we hitting some biological or physics constraint that is, you know, is not, that the math isn't going to, the signal processing isn't going to get us any further. Well, yeah, as far as I can see, I, I, I don't see any, any reason to think that you can, uh, pick out sources that are at the millimeter scale from f f just be based on the following, and that is, suppose I have a, uh, a layer here, just an infinite, an infinite, me uh, infinite conduct uh, conductive medium, homogeneous, very simple, and just at the distance between the uh, top of the cortex and the scalp is several centimeters, a centimeter or two. And just looking at that distance, there's limitations as to what you can, you can get. And that's independent of the volume conductor model. And then you put the skull in there and it becomes even worse because of the smearing effect of the skull. So even if, you know, what's happened, for example, in, in the modeling is we used to think that this conductivity ratio of skull to brain was like one over 80. That was the original papers. And um, there's better work now showing that that ratio is more like 1 over 40 or 1 over 20. But that doesn't change this argument at all that I made because it's, the distance effect is still in there. Even if the, even if the skull were, uh, even if the brain were completely homogeneous, you could still come up with the same answer. So you need, you need uh, I, I would be very skeptical, and also, you know, I should also mention experimentally uh, the, the spontaneous EEG that I've seen, typically where they've recorded from both the cortex and the scalp, the ratio, amplitude ratios tends to be like in the 2 to 5 range, not 100 to 1, but more like 2 to 1 or 5 to 1. And uh, I haven't seen anything to... Although that, 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 that two to five ratio depends on frequency and you get higher, higher and higher frequency stuff in the cortex, then it tends to be attenuated because it's less coherent over large distances. How do you square that five to one? You mentioned the hundred to one. Yeah. Oh, because, because uh, spontaneous EEG, most of the spontaneous EEG that I've seen is clearly large dipole layers. Going back to this infinite plane of sources, if you have an infinite plane of sources, by infinite I just mean that the, the size is large 
compared to the distance between cortex and scalp. And you go up here, you see that y you get a ratio uh, without the skull or anything in there. It's, the ratio is one. In other words, there's no t attenuation due to the distance at all be, 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 uh, above a large dipole layer. And the reason is because as you go up further and further, you get further, you get much further from the local sources, but you don't get any further from the di distant sources. Now, instead of the ratio being one, the experimental ratio is more like two. Where does that come from? Well, if you put the skull in there, then you get this factor of two. And it, it all fits in. So if you've got a picture there of EEG being generally due to large dipole layers, whether the larger the dipole layer, the, the, the bigger your amplitude on the surface, it fits in with a lot of different experiments that you look at from different, different viewpoints. In fact, uh, uh, a lot of the people that work on spontaneous EEG use the word desynchronization to indicate amplitude reduction, because they've already assumed that this, this is the case. The, well, if you have a, a I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but if you have a distribution of sources, uh, then it's generally you have to conclude monopolar contributions to those sources. I'll give you an example, and that is uh, the action potential in a uh, myelinated, ax uh, myelinated fiber. Uh, the sources are distributed over the centimeter scale length of the fiber. And there, therefore, you can't use any kind of dipole model. The monopolar terms dominate. In order to estimate that, you have to, uh, you have to represent the, all these sources as little patches along the, the fiber itself, and, and you can't use the dipole approximation. I don't know if that answers your question, but... Uh, Yes. Well, we've always, let me put it this way. When I first got into the field, there was this question of whether synaptic sources or action potential sources uh, are the main contributors to EEG. And what's happened over the years is that it's been shown that the, the synaptic picture fits the data pretty well fits the data really well. And you can explain a lot of things by just assuming that all you have is synaptic sources contributing to EEG, partly for the reasons that I just gave about dipole layers of different sizes. But that doesn't mean that there's no contribution from action potentials. It just means that you don't seem to need that hypothesis in order to explain the data. Uh, paraphrasing Napoleon. No, Napoleon said, you know, I have no need of that hypothesis when talking to Laplace about the existence of God. Sorry. Little side issue. Yes, Paul, I, I was wondering about your current views on the, on the algorithm. Uh, in the old days, it was supposed to be generated by a thalamocortical generator is one part of the question, but um, you know, there's lots of evidence that um, there's a regional a reduction of the algorithm, desynchronization uh, in the visual areas and your, the extent that you're processing visual information. And then there's more recent evidence suggesting algorithms increase. 
you want to suppress visual input, do you have any thoughts on what the, what's represented by the algorithm? Yeah, I do. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> uh, I've got a nice quote here from uh, Gray Walter. You know, I won't read it. It's somewhere on one of these slides, but anyway. Basically said that what we call the alpha rhythm is a complex process consisting of all these different things going on. Now, I didn't, I, I've got up here high resolution EEG, which is the, uh, which I mean the, using the Laplacian on the, on the alpha rhythm or other th things. But uh, the nice thing about this is that you can apply these methods to pick up sources of different scales. And what we found uh, is that, first of all, what we call the alpha rhythm consists of several things, at least several things. One is thalamo, uh, localized alpha rhythms, which are probably or possibly thalamocortical kind of interactions, plus at least one global rhythm, which is take, uh, generated in the entire cortex itself. And so all these different things can, can go on, and, uh, and, and the mental activity will, we've shown, for example, that uh, if you give somebody a mental task, that the coherence in, the, in part of the alpha band uh, will uh, go down, while the coherence in the upper part of the alpha band will go up. It's, it's more complicated than that, but that's basically the idea. So that when you say alpha rhythm, I say, wait a minute, alpha rhythms, plural. So I, I think that uh, I, I've always found the alpha rhythm, alpha rhythm I, I, I make the same mistake, alpha rhythms to be uh, really interesting because of all this uh, changes in fun functional connectivity that occur with different mental states. I don't know if I got the whole answer to your question. You think it, it, does an increase in alpha rhythm associated with an increase in connectivity among, amongst the neighboring neurons? Or what, what, what's happening in a, 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 on a neuronal level when the alpha rhythm is larger versus smaller? Well, the amp yeah, well, uh, we expect the amplitude to go up if it's more it's more synchronized. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, synchrony and coherence are not exactly the same thing because synchrony means that everything's phase locked, whereas coherence means that whatever phase difference between different regions is, is consistent over time. So, uh, so I, I would say that what's happening, it, what a, my, my uh, explanation which would be partly a guess, anyway, of what's happening when you do certain kinds of mental activity, is that you have this kind of general global rhythm, which tends to go down, both in amplitude and and also in in coherence. While uh, the more localized alpha rhythms, along with theta activity, also at the same time, tends to go up. So it looks to me like you can th describe this in terms of kind of a global environment, which is there all the time, and embedded in this global environment are these networks which are activated depending on what kind of mental activity that you're, that you're carrying out. So I like the analogy of, again, I, I looked for analogies, I looked for the social systems. And uh, I think of a a social network embedded in a culture. But what is a culture? A culture is a bunch of social networks, but it's a kind of a global measure of all these networks acting together. And uh, so what can happen is the connectivity within a social network can go up or down, but that's influenced top down by the global behavior of the system, which is a bunch of networks all acting together. <laughs>
So as far, based on what I know, I've seen and I know, that's kind of my best picture of what's going on. But again, I think this idea, you know, again, making guesses about what's going on based on what you know about other, other complex systems seems to me to be a, a fruitful way of, of proceeding. Make, makes your best guesses. One last question. Um, well, it's it, it's um, it's a matter of you know what you're trying to get at, I guess. Um, I I've never been a, f a fan of source localization because it didn't seem to fit with the data that I've seen. Seen. It doesn't mean that it can't ever be done, and I think I suspect that these source localization algorithms, in a lot of cases, are able to find the centers of distributed activity. Now that can be very valuable if you're, if, you're a, if you're a surgeon and you're trying to figure out where to implant an electrode array in the cortex. Then you do a source localization, you find out what, your, what I would call a, a representative source rather than a genuine source representative source of this spatially distributed activity and then you say okay well I'm going to center my my cortical electrode array on that center knowing full well that this is not really localized and I think uh, in the case of uh, if you're going to do this in a dolphin then maybe the same kind of uh, philosophy would hold Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. Thank you.